Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. In our Wednesday services, uh, we are looking at the parables of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it was suggested to me that we take a look at the parable of the Good Samaritan. So I'll be looking at Luke chapter 10 if you want to follow along the Lord has sovereignly chosen and sent out the 70 he's the one that gave them the message and of course he's the one that declared that his word would accomplish what he intended he's the one that sent it out and and it it is said that it will not return unto him void. When they came back, they rejoiced that even demons were subject to them. And he told them not to rejoice in that, but to rejoice in the truth that their names had already been written down in heaven, uh, perfect tense, written down in past time with the result that they remain permanently written down. And then the Lord rejoices and uh, tells His disciples uh, that they're very blessed because they've seen and, and they've heard things that the, the prophets desired to see and hear. So as we begin, uh, verse 25, uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 25, Behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so that's where we begin. That's where we begin here. I want you to note that it is a certain lawyer. A certain lawyer. It's, it's, it's just not any old lawyer. I mean, there are lots of those. It was a certain lawyer. I'm going to suggest this, this man couldn't have done anything but what he did. You know, and we can, uh, we can spend hours and hours, as, as many I'm sure have, trying to probe into the purpose of this individual's questioning. What the Spirit says is he was a certain lawyer. It was one that God laid his hands on. He stood up asking a question and tempted him, tempted the Lord Jesus Christ saying, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now there are two words in the English language, tempt and prove. The word in this verse is a derivative of, of the Greek word peirazo, uh, which means to tempt. It means if, if you it means if you want to use the word uh, test, it means to test something to prove that it's no good. Uh, God never uses this word of us. Uh, we're told in James. Don't let any man say when he's tempted to evil that he's tempted of God, for God tempts no man to evil, and he himself is untemptable. That's this word. On the other hand, we have passages of, of Scripture. Uh, for example, uh, the Lord knows the way I take, and when He has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Some translations have the word tempt, but actually the word is more like our English word uh, prove for acceptance. Uh, dodzo means to test something in such a way to prove that it's good. Uh, Peirazo means to test it in such a way to prove that it's not any good, that it's no good. And you can't do that with God. But that's what this attorney did. He's one who is skilled in the law the Jewish law, and he stands up to prove that Christ is wrong. He 
He wants to find something that can be uh, le- that can legally be used ag- against him. And so he says, "Teacher, uh, this is not the word here for Lord. That word, teacher, it's not the word for Lord. It's just it's the word for teacher." What shall I do to inherit eternal life? The word is, in, is inheritance. What can I do to get my share of that? And so this, this, etern- this attorney, he's worded this, this question in such a way that he's going to do something once and inherit eternal life. Once. It looks as though the question is phrased, though, uh, you know, what one thing could I do and only have to do it once and inherit eternal life? Now, the creator of heaven and earth could have said a thousand things and said them much better than I or anyone else who's ever commented on this text could say it. But what he said, folks, is fabulous. When you look at the, at, the, at the training, the obvious training and education, the schooling of the, the one who's uh, asking the question, his area of discipline is law. And, you know, that's, that's where you'd expect him to be proficient. And that's where Christ went. He said unto him, What has been written in the law? My Bible says, uh, What is written in the law, but it's a perfect passive. What has been uh, written in the law in past times so that it stands completely written? How do you read the law? Now, now that's a fabulous question for this attorney. And apparently he's well-schooled in the law. You know, he should be. And so he answers, and we're all familiar with these words. He answers, and, uh, and he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. But the Greek word love is a present tense. It's not an aorist tense, you know, that sees the action as a whole. It's a present tense. I can't emphasize that enough. Present tense. Uh, it is not saying do this once and you'll inherit eternal life. And nobody could read the law that way. He quotes something that is contrary to his very question, what shall I do once for all? And then he quotes something that is a continuing, uh, never-ending, without a single break process. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor is thyself continually, nonstop, without interruption. Now that's the first commandment, as, as you may well know. That's a basic precept of the law in which this individual is, is educated, skilled. It's exactly the answer he should have, have given from his training, and I'm dead certain it's the answer Christ expected him to give. And it may be one of the reasons why this attorney was singled out. Singled out. Okay? To ask the question. This just didn't happen by happenstance. I mean, it just didn't, just didn't happen that way. Uh... 
to get down to verse 28. And he said to him, You have answered rightly, do this and you will live. You know, you've answered right. Now, I'm certain that many, Christ, many Christians would uh, say that's, that's not right. Christ shouldn't have said that. Christ should have told him what we read in Galatians. You know, if there had been a law given which uh, could have given life, then verily righteousness should have been by the law. Why didn't Christ point that out to him? I mean, it, it's clearly pointed out to us in Galatians. The law is not of faith. Uh, Christ had the book of, of Habakkuk. Uh, the justified man shall live by his faith. That is the faithfulness of Christ. And, and of course, the great argument there is, is, is uh, uh you know, is what, it, what does that mean? What is, what is meant by that? God's, is that God's faith or is that your faith? And anybody that's been listening to this channel very long knows that my particular prejudice, it's God's faithfulness. You don't live by your faithfulness. You live by the faithfulness of God. Christianity has so departed from the marvelous message of the gospel, it's unbelievable. You know, we're trying more and more to lead people to believe that it's their faith uh, uh, that gives them eternal life. When the scriptures clearly declare it's God's faithfulness. Christ had those, those texts, but Christ hadn't died yet. You know, it's interesting to see what the attorney says. Christ said, You've answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. And the word there, dearly beloved, the word do is the same word that the attorney used in verse 25. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And his, so his question makes it clear what he meant. What he meant was, I want to do something once and for all. I got to have this settled. Now, you can say that's terrible what that guy's trying to say, but that's what Christians are saying today. You know, if we could just get you to believe that, well, then we got it settled. We can now we can go now go and get the next guy, and they make it just that trashy, as though it's not God's faithfulness at all. And if we could just get them to believe, once we once we got them last, so then well, then now we can go on to the next one, you know, and the next one. And this attorney wanted to do something. What can I do? You know, I want this settled. You know, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. So that I'll inherit eternal life. And Christ comes back and says, You've answered correctly. That's what the law says. How do you read the law? This do, present tense, same word, same word, but present tense. Now, any of you who've ever opened the book of Galatians, looked at the book of Galatians, I mean, most people have, at least at some point, you know, we know from Galatians that everyone that is under the law is under the curse for it's written, you know, Christ knew it, it was written. Christ had written it. Cursed is everyone that continues not in every single thing written in the law. That's the problem with law. It's not, an, it's not an heiress tense. You can't stand before the judge and have your attorney pl plead that, you know, that, well, well you, you, you did put money in a parking meter once or that there was a time when, uh, uh, one time when you did obey the speed limit or any, any other application that you want to make. It simply doesn't work with law. 
And Christ's answer is absolutely right. You do this eternally without a single break. You do this all the time, all the time, all the time. Thou shalt live. Now, this lawyer, he had a problem. You know, he asked what he should do. He wanted to do something and have it settled. Christ told him what he had, had to keep on doing every second of every minute of every hour of every day, a burden that he couldn't possibly handle. And so, and so as a result, look at your text. Willing to show himself to be righteous, justified. He's now going to question the meaning of the words in the law. He knows what the law is. Justified. That word justified, folks. We talked about that word a lot. You know, so this lawyer, willing to show himself righteous, to justify himself, said, Who is my neighbor? Now, I don't know whether you find that significant or not. I think, I think that's fabulous. Why didn't he say, you know, why didn't he say, this lawyer, folks, why didn't this lawyer say, well, teacher, what, what does it mean to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself? What does that mean? What do, you, what do you mean with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind? Lord, we, we got to dig into these words. But he didn't ask that. Folks, I don't know whether you see it or not. You got to see the sovereign hand of God on this. He didn't bring up any of that. I believe it's by the sovereign direction of God that he asked the question. You know, he did, but bear in mind, he couldn't, he couldn't hack the other ones anyway. What he thought was he had an opportunity here. Now, I don't want to read too many white spaces. I get accused of doing that uh, a lot. Uh, I don't know how you come to the Word of God. I don't in any way want to push this book or make it say something it doesn't say. But looking at the setting, the, the question of this lawyer and his knowledge of the law, I'm at least willing to concede probably in my mind that he was pretty good with his peers. But he wanted to justify himself. He desired to show himself righteous before our Lord. to justify himself. So he asks Jesus, who is my neighbor? And when the answer comes back, he's going to be able to say, well, I do that all the time. You know, I'm sure he thought in his mind that he had, he had been more than, than neighborly to all of his neighbors, so I don't have to bring up any discussion of, of, of loving the Lord with all my heart and all my strength and all my mind and all my soul. These are words that would require an immense amount of discussion to even begin to plumb the depths of loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart and strength and mind and soul. But the last expression in the first commandment is so simple. Thy neighbor as thyself. The standard of loving my neighbor is no higher than the standard of loving myself. It doesn't say, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, etc., etc., and thy neighbor the same way you love God. It doesn't say that. So I have a much easier standard when it comes to the neighbor because my love for him is no higher and no different than my love for myself. Now, I'm not certain what this, uh, this individual Pharisee, I'm going to call him a Pharisee, 
thought that he might be able to, to argue out of this, but I'm quite certain that that was the basis of his question. But note that he avoided the areas where he couldn't possibly have any defense, and he chose the one where he thought that he could show himself righteous. Who is my neighbor? Now, you know, the word normally means the one close to you in our English language. Uh, I think normally the word neighbor means the guy that lives next door, you know, or or at least in, in our neighborhood, you know, on our block, you know, our street, whatever. And I'm sure, I'm fairly certain that that's the way that the attorney saw it. And that's, I'm sure that's an area where he thought he had an opportunity to justify himself. You know, that he hadn't sicked his dog on the neighbor or he hadn't picked up his leaves at, at uh, and dumped them over on the neighbor's lawn or any of those other unneighborly things, you know. Note how Jesus took him up on it. And he said, and here's where we get into what we're looking at as a parable. A certain man went down from Jerusalem a certain man went down from Jerusalem. Oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble for this one. I'm going to suggest that this is not a parable. Notice it says a certain attorney, a certain attorney, there's no mention of this being a parable like we normally see. I believe it was a true account of something that occurred, that happened, that Christ knew about, which he wouldn't have had to hear about it. He's God Almighty. But it's not, I'm going to suggest it's not a parable. And that puts me at odds with 99.9% uh, .9 of, of Christians out there probably, and I don't care. I don't see where it says it's a parable. It looks to me like it's a true account. And so that's what I'm going to suggest. I don't suggest that you just throw your hands up and say, well, Steve says it's not a parable, so it must not be a parable. But folks, I have to be honest with the text. I don't see any indication at all anywhere where that this is a parable. I think Christ Jesus is teaching this lawyer something using a real life example of something that actually happened. It's not a parable to explain or teach a very, very vital doctrinal truth. And we'll get to that, I hope. Lord willing here. So, uh, notice it says a certain attorney. My interpretation of this is that it really happened. There was, a, there was a Pharisee whose skill was in the law who stood up and questioned Christ, and this is the answer that he gave. And Christ told him about a man who went down from Jerusalem. These things really happened. And so whatever applications that we make, they have to be biblical. And I think I can say without exaggeration that at least a thousand applications have been made on the account of the Good Samaritan. Most people even forget the fact that it was introduced because this attorney said, who is my neighbor? I don't know what answer Christ could have come up, up with, probably any number of them, but what he came up with was the historical account of something that really happened. He didn't make it up and it isn't a parable. A certain man. I don't know whether he's a Jew, a Gentile. I assume he's a Jew. I, I don't know that, but I think he's a Jew. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume that he is. A Jew went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. That's downhill most of the way. Even today, it's a, it's a really rough, 
lonely sort of a journey, uh, a rough country in that area. But back then it was inhabited by, with, you know, robbers and thieves and it was a dangerous trip. Now this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And I, gotta, I just got to stop right there and for a moment. Making that trip alone wasn't really super smart. And everybody knew that. Guy shouldn't have done this. Now, is he foolhardy? And I guess that's a matter of opinion. I'm going to say probably, but I'm also going to suggest that I think he's in the hand of God. I am positive this man made this trip by the sovereign direction of Almighty God that we might have this story. And you say, well, you know, does God have the right to use someone that way? Well, if he doesn't have that right, then he isn't God. Cannot I do with my own as I please, says God? And the answer has to be yes. I mean, you know, did, did God have the right to do with Job as he did? And why did he do it? Why did he do it with Job? So that you and I might have the story. So that you and I might realize that when God says, Have thou considered the steadfastness of Job? You know, that, that you can go back and read it and see he wasn't steadfast. That it's got to be the grace of God. Just as God says that Lot's righteous soul was tormented day and night by what he saw in Sodom. What, what do you mean Lot was righteous? Well, because he was a new creation in Christ. So this certain man on whom God laid his hand went from Jerusalem to Jericho. Stupid thing to do in, in, in man's eyes. Many would say that he got what he deserved, and you could say he did. But I believe God laid his hand on him, and God used his stupidity in a tremendous way when it comes to this lawyer and you and me. Can't God do that? If God can't do that, then I, I want to worship a different God. Why can't it be that when I, I don't know what the circumstances are, when I don't know what's going on, when I don't know what God is doing, why can't I trust Him? And, and, and believe that it, it's not only for my good, but for the good of the body, the good of others as well. Why can't I understand from a simple study of His Word that there's a, a purpose and a plan in what He's doing in my life as well as in yours? He can do with me as He pleases. I mean, we got, we got plenty of passages of Scripture. Samson's, Samson's father and mother, they didn't know that it was of the Lord. I, I don't think they knew that it was of the Lord. But you know, you know that what touches you is of the Lord. If you've got good health, He gave it to you. It's of the Lord. If He takes it away, He took it away for His glory. I think that if, you know we see this person in glory, I kind of expect to, I think, he, I think he'll be thrilled to learn that God chose to use him to teach a mighty lesson, a passage of Scripture that's been used in a million sermons over the years. Some applications are, are not biblical. Some are. The interpretation is that it happened. It was a certain man who made a stupid journey 
stupid from man's perspective, to go alone where danger was so high, but I believe he was directed by the sovereign hand of God. You might want to think about that the next time that you regret something. And I need I want to I want to clarify this by saying that we all have regrets. But it's it's not of the spirit, it's of the flesh, it's of the old man. Uh, we'll always at some point have some type of regret. But you know the you know, to say, well, you know, if I just hadn't done this I just hadn't done that or the other thing. You know, I've heard Christians say that so many times. I call that attitude athe atheistic. Uh, people get mad at me for that, but, but that, that's what it is as far as I'm concerned. Regrets are the very heart of atheism. If you're going to spend your time regretting that you made a wrong decision or a wrong move or a wrong turn or you took the wrong plane or the wrong train or you rode the wrong bus, then you're telling me straight from the shoulder God's not working all things after the counsel of His own will in your life. I know it may look terribly stupid from the standpoint of man. It, you know, it does. I don't know why he'd make that trip alone. But he did. And he fell among thieves and robbers, and they stripped him of his clothes, and they wounded him, and they departed, leaving him half dead. Now, I don't know what half dead means. Except maybe in critical condition, you might say. But that's what they did to him. He was severely wounded. There was more than one of them. He didn't have a chance. They knew what they, was, they were doing, and that's always true in the case of the thief or the robber. He's the one, that, he's the one on pins and needles. He's the one that's uh, infinitely more likely to shoot than you. And you're not going to shoot unless you absolutely have to. He's going to shoot on a moment's notice to save his life. They stripped him, they robbed him, they wounded him, and they left him half dead. Now, if you have the authorized version, and by chance there came down a certain priest, by chance there came down a... I don't like that translation. I don't even think that's the right translation. Nothing happens by chance. It happened that a certain priest came that way. Why do you suppose that priest went that way? I'm going to say it was by the direction of God. Why didn't he get robbed and beat up? He could have just as easily been. I'm going to suggest that it's because it had to be a Samaritan in order for the event to, to concur with the lesson that Jesus is, is, is teaching here. It happened that there came down a certain priest. This was a priest on whom God laid his hand. Could have been another priest come down who to help this guy. Uh, don't, please, don't spend your time, you know, as a as like a, a thousand sermons do. You know, well, he couldn't afford to help this man; he would have been defiled. You don't know that he's going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, so he's not serving in the temple. He's apparently served his tour of duty, and and secondly, he's got to touch a dead man or a defiled man before he'd be defiled. The man isn't dead. You know, and you, you can do all the arguing that you want. He looks at him. He thought he was dead. Maybe. So he didn't want to touch a dead body. I, I don't have any of that. I, I guess, you know, you could, you're entitled to your white spaces as well, but uh, I don't know. I don't know that that's true. I think he didn't want to become involved. But more than that, I think it was by the design and the wisdom of God that this priest came and, and, and he saw him clearly. He saw him and he passed by on the other side. And then a Levite came. 
And when he came, he looked on him, and he passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, once again, a certain Samaritan, once again we see the sovereign hand of God. You know, I'm sure that there was probably Samaritans who came by and looked at that Jew and said, well, you know, you got what you deserved. But not this one. A certain Samaritan came by as he was journeying. Present tense. He came where he was. And when he saw him, he was moved with compassion on him. He was moved, made to be moved. It's a passive voice with compassion on him. Someone caused him to be moved with compassion. I don't think I have to suggest who, who I think that was. So he goes to him. He binds up his wounds. He pours in oil and wine. That's, I, I reckon that's uh, probably, you could say, disinfected his wounds. And he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him there at the end. And the, the next day when he left, he left enough money to pay for another day. He tells the innkeeper, take care of him. And if you spend more on the guy, then when I come again, I'll pay you back. Now, which one of these do you think was neighbor to him that fell among thieves? Well, the answer is going to be him that showed mercy, of course, but, but neighbor is an interesting word. There, what Christ is telling this attorney, what he's saying is that he's the neighbor of that man who's half dead as well as the man being half dead being his neighbor, and they don't live near to each other. And the attorney... I guess it's worth mentioning, I have, I consider people that live across the other side of the world my neighbor, okay? Uh, he that showed mercy on him. Now, I don't know that he said that in order to avoid admitting that a Samaritan might be a, actually might be a decent person, but it looks like he did. We know how, how the Jews felt about Samaritans. Rather than use the word, he said, he that showed mercy. He didn't, he didn't say, well, the Samaritan. He, he said, he that showed mercy. And so Jesus says, he says, Go, present tense, and do, present tense, the word's poieo, same word as, as do back in verse 25, the same thing. And so now, all of a sudden, this man who's willing to justify himself sees that every man in the gutter, every drug addict, every criminal, every man who's going through any kind of hard difficulty, every man that's in bad circumstances, every individual that, he's, that he ever will ever meet that's, that is in need, any kind of need, physical, spiritual, is his neighbor. Telling, Jesus telling him something to do that is impossible to do unless you're a new creation in Christ. Whether you have a new nature, which, which you can do, that is continuously, uninterrupted, without stop. That's what the new, new man is. That's what the new nature is. His seed abides in us and we cannot sin. The new man cannot sin. All the old man does is sin. This, I, what I'm seeing here is that Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, in His confrontation with this particular lawyer, 
He was looking for something to justify himself, something, one thing that he could do to inherit eternal life, settle the matter, it's done, he doesn't have to worry about it anymore. And what does Jesus say? Present tense, continually, without stop, without interruption. And he's got to realize that he'll never make it without the fulfillment of the law in Christ Jesus, as a new creation in Christ Jesus that doesn't distinguish between Jew and Gentile or Samaritan or anything else. He can't continue to completely do it as the Lord says He's got to do. The law cannot justify us. What appears, folks, to be a parable, I'm going to suggest it's not is a lesson taken from a real-life circumstance to illustrate a major vital point as it regards our Lord's ministry to His people Israel, which our Lord often and consistently did. That's what I'm saying in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Thank you for listening. I love you all. I truly do. We're back in 2 Corinthians Sunday. Let's close with a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So thankful for the opportunity that you give us to just to hold your word in our hands, to feast upon it, to talk about it, to meditate on it, to apply its precious and wonderful truths to our lives. I just ask you to filter out all the foolishness, all the ignorance, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth, for we long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen.